a blank screen, so I think we're good. Let's see. Yes. Okay. There's so much technology on me right now. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> overwhelming. Can everybody, um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes? Okay, I'm not used to using microphones, so this will be a new experience. Just put your hand up if you, if you can't hear me for some reason during the talk. So first of all, I'd like to thank you so much for having me. This is just, this is my first trip to Korea, so it's just been this really exciting experience. I was upgraded to business class on my way here, which was amazing. Um, so I just have had just, and it's just been so wonderful getting to meet all of you. I'd like to thank the organizing committee for doing such a wonderful job of, of organizing this conference. It's so professionally run, and also you just have phenomenal dance moves. So I'm very <laughs> impressed by that as well. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about something that I'm very passionate about, which is uh, communication, particularly in presentations. And I, um, you know, am, am particularly excited about you know, working with scientists and engineers because I think that this is an area that a lot of a lot of scientists and engineers aren't necessarily taught. You know, how to give a good presentation. So that's basically what I'm going to talk about today. And the story starts um, in about 2006 when I moved to Drexel University. I started there as the head of marketing. And I'll be honest with you, I was a little bit terrified. You know, so so one of my big jobs there was to basically talk to the faculty and students about the work that they were doing and then turn around and turn that into a web page or a magazine article or um, a press release and share that with the general public in a way that they could understand. And so it was my job to basically go in and, and ask what I thought were these really stupid questions to the faculty and to the students. I mean, I knew you know, very little about science and engineering. I was an English major. You know, so, so this was like a world that was so foreign to me. And so I was really terrified. But what I found that was really reassuring is that everybody was just very excited to talk about their work. They were really passionate about what they were doing. And they didn't seem to think that I was particularly stupid because I didn't know, you know what, they, what they were discussing, that I had to ask a lot of questions. So that made it easier for me. And so I think that's when I started to realize that as a non-scientist, it's my job to basically ask the, ask the questions, be brave enough to ask the questions. And it's your job as scientists and engineers to do the best job that you can effectively communicating that information to me. And so, that, and so in that way, we start to bridge that gap, you know, the gap between science and, and society. So then I'm going to move along here to, uh, this is actually in 2009. And so I'd been at Drexel for a few years at this point. I was really loving my job. And um, this is me meeting Jamie Hubo, who is a humanoid robot. And one of the reasons that I picked this example is because Jamie Hubo was actually developed here at KAIST and shipped over to Drexel University for researchers to study. So I know that I, I look a little bit goofy in that picture. You know, I, I have this sort of silly smile on my face. I don't really like having, I don't really, I don't really like having my photo taken all that much. So, um, so this whole, you know, week so far has been quite an experience having so many cameras and video cameras <laughs> around. But anyway, so, so here I am meeting, meeting Jamie Hubo, and I really feel more like the little girl in this picture who's just sort of sitting there with her mouth open because she is so amazed at meeting, you know, this robot. So the other reason that I show you this is because this is actually a great example of where communication is so important. So since 2009, I think there have been six other robots that have been built and shipped over to Drexel University. And Drexel's working with KAIST and, and several other schools on this big sort of collaborative grant to study these robots. And these robots are being studied for a lot of different reasons. Um, but one in particular is that they hope to use these robots in disaster relief, you know, basically sending them in where it's too dangerous for humans to go, which I think is this really positive sort of wonderful thing, right? It's great. It's great that this work is being done. But from what I understand, talking to my predecessor at Drexel, because uh, I've since left Drexel, so, uh, and, and talking and reading some interviews with the faculty, basically there's a concern by the non-scientists, by the general public, you know, when they hear about this research, they're a little worried that, you know, the robots are going to take over the world sort of thing. You know, they think they're going to like wake up one morning, and I might be exaggerating a little bit here, but, but they're going to sort of walk out into the science fiction movie. But that's not really, I mean, that, that's sort of not where we're headed. You know, so I think this is an example of, of, a, of a case where it's really important to have clear communication about what the intention is for the research that they're doing. 
there are a couple other reasons that I think communication is, is really important for engineers and scientists and the general public. I mean, there are many reasons, but I'll give you two. One is that, you know, you as scientists and engineers basically build the things that society uses, right? They're, they're generally the end user. Um, and frankly, almost all cases that I can think of. So you want to make sure that you're having that conversation with them. You want to make sure that they're a part of that conversation. The other thing is that when you look at uh, the people who are the most influential and who frankly have the money that's going to support your research, they're not always scientists and engineers. In fact, in most cases, they don't come from a scientific background. So if you look at uh, Time Magazine, from this is actually the 2012 issue, the 100 most influential people, there are some scientists and engineers on there, which is wonderful, uh, but, but many aren't. Many are musicians, actors, activists, politicians. I think there's a chef on there. Um, you know, so there are a lot of different backgrounds. So you need to be able to communicate with those people if you want to connect with the influential people and be able to have your work supported. And I'll be honest, communication is difficult. You know, it just, it's difficult in any field, not just science and engineering. But I think that science and engineering is particularly difficult for a couple of reasons. And so I think about it almost as like this bridge, um, you know, that's, it's almost harder to build because, you know, perhaps you have to build higher pillars or you have a greater distance to cross. So some of the reasons that I think the level of detail that's inherent in your work can be challenging to communicate. I think the background knowledge that you need to communicate that or to understand it, you know, is, is a lot to sort of summarize to the general public. The terminology, so the jargon, you know, I mean, we saw if, if uh, any of you attended um, Tyler DeWitt's talk yesterday, you, 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 he talked about that, you know, and he read you some chapters where there's a lot of terminology there. And then the theories, the complex theories. So that's a lot to get across. Um, so what I want to do, as I said, is basically talk about presentations in particular, because there are a lot of different kinds of communication. You know, there, there's loads of different kinds. So for our purposes for this hour, I want to make sure that we're focusing on that. Um, the other thing that I'll say, the other reason I pick presentations is that I happen to think presentations are just amazing. I think they're so transformative and wonderful. I think there are very few other things that can be as magical as a, as a good presentation. So that's why I also just really love presentations. And I want to start by asking you a question, because I think that you guys are actually the experts on presentations. And so that question is, who is the best speaker of science or engineering that you have seen? And what is it that made them so effective? And you can pick anybody. It doesn't have to be somebody famous necessarily. It can be a faculty member that you work with. So who is the best speaker of science or engineering? that you have seen. Go ahead and give it, a, give it a thought for a second and somebody be brave and raise their hand. Yes, thank you. Tyler, do it. <laughs> Tyler, yes, all right, yes. Tyler's wonderful. Is he here? No, he's not. Okay, all right, we won't tell him that you said that or maybe we will. Yes. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, yes, he's excellent. So, so what, what do you think makes Steve Jobs so effective? Uh, his speech is uh, impressive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, he's a very effective presenter. He's very art articulate, absolutely. And what do you think makes Tyler so effective? Uh, he, <laughs> he changes the difficult terms into more easy terms for the people to understand. Right. So it's easy for people to approach what he's trying to say. Right, right. So he has a really good sense of his audience and where they're, where, what their background is, where they're coming from. Anybody else? <clears throat> Those are the only two people we like. Okay, yes. Uh, Yes, he's excellent. And what makes him so effective? Uh, not only was he a pioneer and expert in physics and mathematics, he uh, ended up and tried to let the, let the public know about, know more about physics. Mm -hmm. and I think that's yeah, he took on sort of a really difficult topic, right? But he was, again, very articulate. So this is a question. I teach a, a workshop on, on presenting with a couple of colleagues from Penn State. And so collectively, we have asked this question to thousands of engineers and scientists. And what's interesting is that the same three concepts come up over and over again as to what makes an effective speaker. And the first one of those is excellent content. Um, and so here's uh, Stephen Hawking, who's an example of somebody who has really excellent content, which is why he's so popular. People always want to hear the ideas that he has to share with them. The second one is Hans Rosling. Does anybody know? Who knows Hans Rosling? No? 
OK, good. We have so are you a fan? Uh, not yet. OK, well, he's, he's pretty great. So I'm actually going to show a clip of his, a clip of his talk. And after this, you will all be fans. So he's a statistician. Um, and he has a TED Talk. Does, who knows what a TED Talk is? Everybody knows what TED Talks are? OK, good, good. That's great. So that just wipes out that explanation that I have to do. So we're going to watch an example of his TED Talk. And I want you to think about you know, how passionate he is about his work. So this is where I realized that there was really a need to communicate. Because the data of what's happening in the world and the child health of nearly every country is very well aware. So we did the software which displays it like this. Every bubble here is a country. Uh, this country over here is, um, uh, this is uh, China. And this is India. The size of the bubble is the population. And on this axis here, I put fertility rate. Because my students, what they said, when they looked upon the world, and I asked them, what do you really think about the world? Huh? Well, I first discovered that the textbook was Tintin mainly. Huh? And they said, the world is still we and them. And we is Western world, and them is third world. And what do you mean with Western world? I said, well, that's long life and small family. And third world is short life and large family. So this is what I can explain here. I put fertility rate here, number of children per woman, one, two, three, four, up to about eight children per woman. We have very good data since 1962, 1960 about, on the size of families in all countries. The error margin is narrow. Here I put life expectancy at birth, from 30 years in some countries up to about 70 years. And 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries, and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries. They had large families and they had relatively short lives. Now, what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries. Or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see, we stop the world. And this is all UN statistics that has been available. Here we go. Can you see that? It's China, they're moving the place. <laughs> <laughs> they are moving towards smaller families. The yellow ones here are the Arabic countries and they get larger families, but they, no, longer life, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here, they still remain here. This is India, Indonesia is moving on pretty fast. And in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh, it's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The imams start to promote family planning and they move up into that corner. And in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. <laughs> okay, so who's a Hans Rosling fan now? <laughs> yeah, right? He is pretty awesome. Uh, so what does he remind you of? He re of what? Exactly. Yes, he reminds you of a sports announcer, right? He brings that same enthusiasm to statistics, which frankly I thought were always really boring until I watched this video. He makes them so exciting. So he's somebody that, that's a great example of, of a scientist who brings real passion to the work and, and to their presentations. And then the last thing you need, the third thing, is a, is a good sense of your audience, which we talked a little bit about with Tyler. You know, he has a really good sense of the audience. Uh, Jill Bolte Taylor is our example of that, and we're actually going to watch a clip of hers in a little bit. She has the number two highest viewed talk on TED. Has anybody ever seen her talk before? OK, so we have, all right, so a couple people. Um, so she has something like, last time I checked, 9 million people have watched her talk, which I just think is amazing. Imagine reaching 9 million people. So the audience, so that's a great place to start with your presentations. And that's something I think a lot of people don't necessarily do when they're building a presentation. You want to think about who you're speaking to. And there's some basic questions that you want to ask about your audience to be prepared to put together your presentation. I mean, this is even before you like sit down at the keyboard to build slides. You want to start asking these questions. Uh, and these questions come, most of these questions actually come from a book of my colleague, Michael Alley. He wrote The Craft of the Scientific Presentation. I'll show you a picture of it later. It's a great book to pick up if you want some more information about, about presentations. Um, so some questions to ask. One is, who are they? 
And so not terribly, you know, sort of revolutionary questions. You know, these are pretty basic. So who are they? Who are you speaking to? What do they know? How much background information do they have about your topic? Uh, why are they here? So were they, I mean, it's really important to know if your audience was sort of dragged into the room kicking or screaming, um, or if they're there voluntarily. Uh, what biases do they have? I think this is a very important question. I think if we look at the example of Hubo that I gave earlier, you can see that, you know, that knowing that, that the general public is sort of a little bit nervous about this idea of robots taking over, that's a good thing to know before you go out and present about, about Jamie Hubo. And then how are your ideas relevant to their lives? This is a really important question. This is where we start to think about you know, what details we're going to include in a presentation, right? Because we want to only include the stuff that's most relevant to the audience that we're speaking to. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and how to do that as we go along. So I want to talk about three basic sections. There's three things that you need to think about when you're building a presentation. You want to think about the structure of your presentation. You want to think about the visuals of your presentation. So today I'm going to talk mostly about PowerPoint because that's just what a lot, a lot of people use, but there are certainly other options out there. And then I'm going to talk about delivery, which is a topic that generally people have a lot of questions for me about. So if, if you have questions at the end, we can certainly talk about that too. So when you're thinking about the structure of your presentation, um, I often think back, Einstein famously described developing a new theory like hiking up a mountain. And what he said is that as you start your research in that field, you're, you, know, you start to gain more and more knowledge and you essentially start to climb the mountain until eventually you're at this peak and you're looking back over this body of knowledge that you have. And you can see this little spot at the bottom where you started, but that's almost insignificant now because you have this beautiful view of this field, you know, this, this, this area that you've researched. And so presentations are very similar, except that you're basically bringing an audience behind you up this mountain. Right? So it's your job to sort of decide how you're going to take them to make sure that they see a similar view that you see after you've climbed that mountain. And the way that you do that is you think about the organization and the depth of your presentation. There are other things to consider, but these are two of the most important things to consider. And it's almost like thinking about the pathway up that mountain. How are you going to walk up that mountain? What's the organization and depth of your presentation going to be? And a lot of people start here with this outline slide, right? How many of us have seen a slide like this? And how many of us, God forbid, perhaps have one in a presentation that we've done? I know I had one at one point, right? So there are a couple of problems with doing this, this type of outline slide. One is that, um, you know, this is just not memorable. So the way that our minds work, we can actually retain about three to four chunks of information, pieces of information at a time. And so right here we have 10 bullets, 10 pieces of information already that we have to remember through the whole presentation. That is just not going to be memorable for the audience. You're going to quickly lose them on that path up the mountain. And this is a much more effective way. So this is how I often teach my students. So it's good that you want to break your presentation down into three to four main pieces. And that will allow them to remember through the presentation where they're going and keep themselves oriented. So this example that I've shown you up here comes from a student in Norway called, her name is Katrina Asmo. And she uh, does research on the mercury levels in the Arctic. So they actually dip apparently in the spring. And so she was doing research to, to find out why that is. Uh, so her presentation is broken down into the theory for mercury recycling the measurements that they took at that station, and then the environmental implications of, of this. And she, you can see that she's paired a picture with each of them, which is what we teach students to do, because people remember things, they're much more likely to remember things if they see a picture along with the phrase. So this is going to allow your audience to remember what you're talking about for the entirety of your presentation, which is a good thing, right? We can all agree. The other thing that you can do for organization is think about telling your presentation like a story. And you know, Tyler covered a lot of this yesterday, which I think is great. He really hit on a lot of the key points and why it's fun and engaging and why stories are great. So what I'll just say is that basically, you know, stories are told across all cultures. There's not a culture in the world that does not use stories to pass down information. So that says to me that obviously this is a really powerful form of communication, right? So we want to use this in our presentations. So I'm going to show you an example. We're going to watch a clip uh, from Jill Bolte-Taylor. She does a great job of telling her presentation like a story. And we'll talk about it after, uh, 
after I, I show you this clip. because I have a brother who has been diagnosed with a brain disorder, schizophrenia. And as a sister and later as a scientist, I wanted to understand why is it that I can take my dreams, I can connect them to my reality, and I can make my dreams come true. What is it about my brother's brain and his schizophrenia that he cannot connect his dreams to a common and shared reality, so they instead become delusion. So I dedicated my career to research into the severe mental illnesses, and I moved from my home state of Indiana to Boston, where I was working in the lab of Dr. Francine Venice in the Harvard Department of Psychiatry. And in the lab, we were asking the question, what are the biological differences between the brains of individuals who would be diagnosed as normal control as compared with the brains of individuals diagnosed with schizophrenia, schizoaffective, or bipolar disorder? So we were essentially mapping the microcircuitry of the brain, which cells are communicating with which cells, with which chemicals, and then in what quantities of those chemicals. So there was a lot of meaning in my life because I was performing this type of research during the day, but then in the evenings and, and on the weekends, I traveled as an advocate for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. But on the morning of December 10, 1996, I woke up to discover that I had a brain disorder of my own. A blood vessel exploded in the left half of my brain. And in the course of four hours, I watched my brain completely deteriorate in its ability to process all information. On the morning of the hemorrhage, I could not walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of my life. I essentially became an infant in a woman's body. If you've ever seen a human brain, it's obvious that the two hemispheres are completely separate from one another. And I have brought for you a real human brain. <laughs> so this is a real human brain. This is the front of the brain, the back of the brain with the spinal cord hanging down. And this is how it would be positioned inside of my head. And when you look at the brain, it's obvious that the two cerebral cortices are completely separate from one another. For those of you who understand computers, our right hemisphere functions like a parallel processor, while our left hemisphere functions like a serial processor. The two hemispheres do communicate with one another through the corpus callosum, which is made up of some 300 million axonal fibers, but other than that, the two hemispheres are completely separate. Because they process information differently, each of our hemispheres think about different things, they care about different things, and dare I say, they have very different personalities. Excuse me. <laughs> it's been a joy. Okay, so I love her. I think she's wonderful. Um, I don't know if you can see it because it's a little bit dim, but I, I didn't do this on purpose. I'll pretend that I did. I stopped the clip right where you see the audience's faces, and they're just so engaged and so mesmerized. I think that's great. So there are a couple things that she does to sort of make her presentation like a story. One is that it's a very personal story, isn't it? You know, she talks about her brother. She talks about her own experience. Uh, so it's personal. Another thing that she does is it's her, she has a very conversational tone. You know, she's probably talking, I don't know how many people are in the audience, 1,000, 800, 500, something like that. But it sounds like she could just be talking to one of us over coffee. You know, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, the other thing she does is she has characters, right? I mean, she brings the brain out for everybody to meet. And then uh, what I love are the analogies that she uses. So the fact that she compares the brain to a computer so that, you know, it, it's something that we can sort of relate to and understand, oh, okay, this is how the brain works in a very quick snapshot. So I think she's just, she's wonderful. 
And then when we think about depth, and again, this is something that uh, David Christian talked about this morning, Tyler talked about a little bit yesterday, you know, thinking about the number of details that you're gonna give to your audience. And I think about it a little bit like an iceberg. So an iceberg obviously is this huge ice mass, but you don't see most of it because it's underneath the water, but we know it's there. And that's what you want to think about when you're sharing details with your audience. They're all going to know that there's a huge lump of ice under the water, that you've done a huge amount of work to get to where you are in your, in your you know, presentation. But you only want to show the tip of the iceberg, the part that is most relevant to your audience. So that's just one way to think about which details to include and which to leave out. And one way that this is really important is in our slides. These are our visuals for our presentation. So our slides do three distinct things for our presentation. One is that they help us decide which details we're going to include and which details we're going to leave out. Uh, so if you have a slide with lots and lots of bullet points, you're not going to have done a very good job about leaving anything out, right? You're going to pretty much put everything in. So that's where, you know, slides are where it's a really important time to decide what am I gonna share with the audience. The second way that slides affect our presentation is in our delivery. So if you have a slide with a lot of bullet points that's behind you, you're going to feel like you have to turn around and read it all the time. I mean, I'm sure you've all been to this presentation, right? And it gets, you don't, then you can't form the connection that you, want to, that you want to create with your audience if you're always staring at your slide. And the third way that these affect our presentations is uh, in the comprehension of the audience. So there's been some research done by Michael Alley, who I mentioned earlier. Um, he's from Penn State University, and he's actually shown that people remember more uh, when you use an assertion evidence style of presenting. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about what assertion evidence is, but it's essentially how you see me presenting today. So a lot of visuals with this sentence at the top of the slide. And people remember more this way as opposed to a slide with lots and lots of bullet points. This is an example of a slide with a lot of bullet points, right? And I'm sure we have all seen this slide. And the problem with this is that it, we go into something called cognitive overload, where we actually can't take a presenter talking to us and then also reading all this at the same time. It's more than we can actually handle. So there has been research done by um, a cognitive scientist named John Sweller, who's out of Australia. And what he has shown is that it's actually better to have a black slide, like just a blank background behind you, than have a slide like this up on the screen. Your audience will remember more if the screen is just black than having something like this. So this is not something that we want to do. So this is an example of a slide that we actually show in our workshops and we ask the students, you know, what, what are the problems that you see with this slide? So I'm going to ask you, what are some issues that you see with this slide? What bothers you about that slide? Too many words. Too many words to read. I will pay you your five dollars later <laughs> for answering that. Thank you. That was so perfect. Yes. Too many words. You put just one picture, and it was yeah. kind of a waiting for what's next because there is a huge empty space. Yeah. So there it is. It's too many words. That's that's <laughs> what that's what's coming. Anybody else want to say what's wrong with that slide? I can't guarantee I'm going to magically make it appear up on the screen, but anything else? Yes. Let's see what we have. Cluttered. It's close. Yeah. Not. You're, it, there's too much. You're not sure what order to read it in. Yes. So it's like unclear. Yes. Oh my gosh, you guys are amazing. <laughs> okay, so yes, yeah, so, so a lot of the text is unreadable and the graphics are unclear because there's so much on there that you can't see. Oh my God, you guys just made my presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that was so exciting. Okay, so, so we can sort of agree that this is, not, this is not a great way to present. And these types of slides, I think, often accepted at scientific conferences as long as the content is good. Now, I would argue that there's a better way to present at scientific conferences, but I think, you know, in what we're discussing today, the general public, this is just absolutely not acceptable. They're not going to follow you up that mountain if you show them slides like this, right? So then the question is, what other options do we have for our visuals? Well, one is this TED style of presenting, which you've seen a couple examples of now, and I'm sure you've all seen, you know, you've all gone and watched um, TED Talks. So this is my colleague, Melissa Marshall, who's also from Penn State. She gives a great talk called Talk Nerdy to Me. It's on TED. It's about three or four minutes long, and it's about communicating science to the public. So I highly recommend it if you haven't watched it. 
But basically in this TED style of presenting, you're, you're backing up your message with visuals. It's a very highly visual mode of presenting, and a lot of times you might not even have anything behind you when you're presenting. So this is one, this is one way. The way that I generally teach um, students first, particularly scientists and engineers, is this assertion evidence method that we were discussing. So this is Michael Alley, and this is his book, The Craft of Scientific Presentations, if you want to learn more about this style. He has really done a lot of work on this. But essentially what this style is, is this. So we have a sentence at the top, this is our assertion. Uh, the sentence is, left aligned and size 28 font bolded in an Arial or Calibri font. And it's very scientific, the reason that we do this. It's because people in the back row can then see and read the sentence. Uh, and then the main body of the slide is the visuals. So that means a picture, a video, graph, data, whatever you'd like to share. And there are a couple of reasons that I really like this style. So one is that as you're developing your slides, it really forces you to focus on what is the main message that I want people to take away from this slide. That's what you're going to write at the top. So it makes you as a presenter be very thoughtful about the visuals that you're creating. And the other reason that I like it is because for a non-technical audience, you know, when they're watching a technical presentation, it happens to all of us, they might be thinking about something else besides your presentation. Right? They might be thinking, oh, after this I have to go uh, pick up some milk, you know, or do, do something else not related to the presentation. And then they can snap back into it and say, oh, wait, I'm supposed to be paying attention. And they can read the sentence at the top and, and you know, continue on your presentation. The last reason I like this is that I think it's just a, a pretty simple way for somebody who doesn't necessarily have a strong design background to begin developing some really great slides. So I really like this. But if there's one thing that you can take away from this, I would say it's to not follow PowerPoint's defaults. They are bad, <laughs> bad, bad, bad. So these bullets are what cause you to put so many written words in your, in your, in your slides. Um, it takes up all that space that can be used for visuals. And then at the top, you know, we have that phrase headline. So yes, there are fewer words there, but it's not going to focus you the way that a full sentence will at the top of your slide. So this is really, really powerful. And then lastly, we want to talk about delivery. So again, just like visuals, delivery is something that the general public is going to have a very high expectation you know, as to what your delivery is going to be like. Because unfortunately, they have examples like Hans Rosling you know, and Jill Bolte-Taylor that you have to, to live up to. But they also have you know, just, just really good presenters available to them on YouTube, on TED Talk. So there's a lot of, a lot of examples out there. So I'm going to show you a clip. Um, to, to sort of show you how, what the expectations that the general public has, not to scare you necessarily, but just to show you that they're there. And let me set this up a little bit. So Hillary Clinton was um, uh, becoming the Secretary of State, and so her Senate seat was open. And Caroline Kennedy, who is the daughter of one of our very famous presidents um, of the United States, was running to fill the Senate seat. Uh, and she basically, as it turned out, had a filler word problem. Does anybody know what a filler word is? Does that make sense? It's basically those ums and so's and you know things that you use to fill in your speech when you're presenting. So this was <laughs> this was basically um, marked with a story from CNN. CNN did a story on it, so we're just going to watch a clip about that. <laughs> You know, I really ought to give it some thought, you know, again. When we start counting, you know. You know, this is not who I am. She is the old grown up man, Caroline Kennedy, you know, in our family, you know, uh, you know first and criticized for not talking to the press or trying to get appointed to fill Hillary Clinton's Senate seat. You know, Hillary Clinton is now too hard for our face. And now that she is talking, we're on her back about excessive, you know, as many as four per second. Now I can tell you that in, in, you know, in our family, in my family, in particular, I think, you know, there was a sense that, um, you know, we have to work twice as hard. A blog called Perfection, noted them as a father. Now I think that, you know, I mean, you know, I have an eclipse. Yeah, I mean, so, like, it's hot, yeah. I mean, so, it's hot. 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 It's
They're the schools that the little phrase that saves us. We thought, but most of us don't even think about it. <laughs> <laughs> You can say I'm throwing them up. They don't. President-elect Obama, no ah. You know, the, uh, I think uh, they're still working it through. Uh, no, wait, the things are broken, that habit. Now, Taylor, and her winking tick. You know why have I been at this place? Five weeks? And we all know President Bush had his linguistic barriers and tariffs. Carriers and banners everywhere. One solution to saying too many you know is to be told every time you say it, and the web is helping Caroline Kennedy with that. You know, we don't you know, you know, you know. <laughs> but the web is allowing silence between thoughts. Sound like that's more eloquent than words, and it's powerful. At least Kennedy knows what she doesn't know. Uh, I have your friends in some words. You know, CNN. So basically, again, I don't want to scare you, but that's to show you that there are very high uh, expectations from the public. So what should we do about this? Well, one thing that you can do is make sure that you're doing your best to let your passion and your enthusiasm show for the work that you're doing and for whatever presentation that you're giving. Because that makes people excited. They like that. They can connect to you. And so the way that you can do that, and, and a lot of people ask me, you know, a lot of delivery tips, and this is just kind of the number one thing that I say, is that you have to prepare and you have to practice. Those are the things that are going to really improve your delivery. And this means practicing in front of the mirror. This means practicing in front of some friends and getting feedback. This means, and I find this a little bit horrifying, this actually means videotaping a presentation that you're going to do and watching it you know, yourself for pointers. But these are the things that make you uh, a, a better presenter. So I recently read a book called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, who is one of my, my favorite authors. And he um, spends, a, you know, the book is about really successful people and, and why, why they're so successful at what they do. So he gives examples like Bill Gates, the Beatles. And what I like is that he talks about how important practice is to, to where, you know, how they've achieved what they've achieved. And I think this is great because I think a lot of times people think, oh, well, you know, public speaking, I'm just either born with that skill or I'm not. And that's just not true. You know, that's just not true. I've seen students who have been so scared to give a presentation that they've been shaking, going from that to presenting in front of 100 or more people. So I know that public speaking is for everybody. Everybody can do it. It just requires you know, a fair amount of practice. So Malcolm Gladwell says, practice isn't the thing you do once you're good. It's the thing you do that makes you good. And he talks about a specific experiment that was done at the Berlin Academy of Music by a psychologist named Dr. Anders Ericsson. And what Dr. Ericsson did is he basically took, uh, he worked with the faculty to divide the violin students into three categories. So there were the categories that were, basically they were exceptional. They were exceptional musicians. They were going to go on to be professional musicians. There was the middle category that they were good. They just weren't, you know, this, this elite caliber. And then there's the third group that basically they were probably going to go on and do something else. They were going to be a music teacher or they were going to go to a different field entirely. And what he found, and all these students started practicing around the same age. You know, they all started practicing around five. And they were all practicing the same number of hours. But by the time they were 20, their practice varied greatly. So the students in this top group were practicing about 30 hours a week on their violin. And that, at that point, you know, by the time they were 20, they had logged about 10,000 hours total of practice. And so there's something kind of magic about this 10,000 hours. This is, this is around when you sort of become a master at something. Uh, Gladwell talks about it in his book. You know, 10,000 hours is something really important. So the middle group, by contrast, had practiced 8,000 hours, and then this last group, 4,000 hours. And so I say this not so that you go practice a presentation for 10,000 hours, which would <laughs> be a, a lot of practice, but just so that you understand sort of the importance of practice in the presentation, you know, and, and delivery um, mode. So basically, I just want to want to wrap up by again moving forward in my career. And so I went from Drexel University to uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, which is a, a basically a, a, an engineering school in um, the middle of Massachusetts in the northeast of the U.S. And I was. Um, you know, I, I was frustrated by the time I reached, you know, the end of my career at Drexel because I just felt like I wasn't having the impact that I wanted to have. 
you know, I felt like I was this ping pong ball between the engineers and the general public and that I was trying my best to translate everything and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do a good job. So I came to WPI and they were in the middle of starting this program called Engineering Ambassadors. And in this program, undergraduate engineering students have extensive training on public speaking and communication and leadership skills. And then they go ahead and apply those skills by going out and giving presentations to middle school and high school students. And so this is a great program because you know students like you are getting extensive training and feedback, but then they're also getting to practice and excite younger generations about science and engineering. So when I found this program, I thought, oh my gosh, this is what I have been looking for. You know, instead of me being the, the, the messenger, I'll just make you guys the messenger. You know, I'll teach you what to do, and then you can go out and share the message that you want to share. And I just thought that was just such a better, better method than me frantically trying to create another website that somebody would read. You know, so I thought this was just a really great program. And where I've gone from there is after I left WPI, I started um, my company. And, and so I'm working with Penn State and also a, a professional group called the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. And we're taking this program nationally and hopefully internationally. So you'll see we have a couple schools, uh, one in Norway and one in China right now, that are starting these programs. And so I, I love what I do. So I get to work with all these people to start this program. But the reason that I'm sharing this with you is because this map says to me that there is a growing movement of people who really care about science communication. And that is so exciting. And what this says to me is that you are the ones who are really driving this movement, that you are the ones who really care about this. And so that just, just makes me really happy. You know, it just makes me smile. I think it's great that, that students are taking an active interest in this and trying to communicate science to the public and bridging that gap. Thank you. So I would be happy to take any questions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I want to know what, what are the, those mistakes. What are the mistakes that I've made? Yeah. And then what, yeah. Can you overcome that problem? Yeah. Um, well, honestly, the most embarrassing thing that I ever did is actually on a job interview, and I had to give, they told me three days ahead of time, I had to give like an hour long presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got up to the front, and I had my water bottle, and I was pretty nervous, and I reached to grab it, and it was open, and it spilled all over my notes. And so there I was at the beginning of my presentation with no notes and it was just horrifying. So I learned to put the cap on my water bottle. <laughs> that was the takeaway from, from that. Um, but you know, I think otherwise, I, what I've learned, I mean, I, I've made a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes in this presentation, but what I learned is that you probably don't know that. You know, that, that it's my presentation. Because I don't have all those bullets up there, you don't know what I'm going to say. So you probably don't notice if I do those mistakes. And I've also just learned that an audience is really a pretty forgiving audience. If you're doing your best, if you're working hard to connect with them, if you make a mistake, they're going to probably be OK with it. You know, so, so I'll you know, crack a joke or do something, but just I move past it. I don't think about it for the rest of the presentation. And then afterwards, I might uh, write some notes in the notes portion of my slides about, you know, I could do this better next time. So that's, I hope that answers your, your question. Yes? Um, my question is that how actually you decide um, the depth of the contents that you're about to deliver. Mm -hmm. Like, mostly it's going to be, it's going to depend on who the audiences are, but I, I don't, like, I have difficulty deciding how deep I'm going to yeah, it's a hard thing to decide. Um, you know, what I would say is that it, a lot of it depends on the time frame that you have. Um, and so that's one thing that I always sort of look at. I think the other thing is really, like you said, thinking about your audience. So what I will often start with in my process for developing a presentation is I will take a thing of sticky notes. Do you guys have sticky notes? Does that even translate those yellow post-it notes? Yeah. So I take those and I write an idea down on, you know, whatever idea, whatever information I want to share in that presentation goes on one sticky note, each idea, you know, one idea per sticky note. And then I spread those all out and I start to organize them. And I start to pull, and it sort of shows me like, wow, you know what, this is just too much information. And then I start to pull out sticky notes and organize them. And then from there I move to typing it 
typing it up on my computer. I actually don't develop slides until after I've written out everything that I'm going to say and then I go start developing the slides. But that process seems to help me and, and it's continuous. I mean I started this presentation um, I don't know probably a month ago before I came here and so by starting that early I allowed myself time to, to keep shifting and adjusting and practicing and getting to the point where I felt comfortable with the, with the depth that I was sharing with you. You're welcome. Yes. Thank you for the excellent uh, <laughs> presentation. Oh, you're welcome. I have uh, ask about the language. Mm -hmm. Since I'm a Korean student and not mother language in English, mm -hmm. I have many troubles in English, so I practice a lot. But I hope to hear about, hear about advice for the foreign student to present in English. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for our students? Because many of these students are Koreans or China. Yeah. So they are not very familiar in English. Right. I think um, one is to practice, like you said. I think that's a really important point. You know, practice is so helpful. The other thing is the speed that you speak. So I think a lot of times people tend to speak really quickly because they feel like the audience is upset that they're not getting through it quickly enough. But, but you really can slow down your speech and that allows you more time to think about the words that you want to use in your presentation. And your audience isn't going to think like while you're speaking really slowly, they're just going to be able to process what you're saying a little bit more easily. So that's, I mean, that's another, um, another you know, tip that I can give you. The other thing I'd say is that you just have to go out and present. I mean, you just have to not just practice behind a closed door, but go out and give a presentation to an audience and, and that will help you improve I think as well. You're welcome. Yes. I've been counting how many of you know as you said and it, that's interesting because maybe English native speakers they mm -hmm. use this you know. Yes. And I have a professor here in Korea. All the times he was going to say something important, a mm -hmm. connection thing, he said the interesting thing uh, is. Yes. So in the end of the semester, he asked us, what is the most interesting thing you see? <laughs> and we said, uh, all the times you said, the interesting thing is everybody's like uh, waiting for. Yeah. What, gonna, what are you going to say? And then uh, my question for you is, how to handle what the times we had group project mm -hmm. and we had made the presentation slides. Sometimes people want fancy colors, too colorful. Yes. How to handle that? Yeah. That, that's a really good question and a really difficult one. You know, so that's something that, that my students, when I teach them, you know, when we start to teach them this style of presenting, that they really struggle with because they suddenly realize this is a much better method and they want to use this, but this isn't something that many people necessarily want to adapt, so it is hard. I think the best thing you can do is to show other group members an example. I think you can bring out some of the research. I mean, you can talk to them a little bit about, you know, people actually learn better with, with this style. There's been research done that has shown this. And just if you can get them to, just ask them to just give you one presentation. You know, try it once. Because I guarantee you, once you see this style, once you even present in this style, you're just not very likely to go back. But I don't have, I mean, I don't have the magic answer for that. It's really a conversation and, and sort of bringing people along to this method. You're welcome. Do we still have time for more questions? Yes? We still have time. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Great. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, you talked about um, how to organize mm -hmm. um, presentation, but what I want to ask is, what would be the attitude or mind below that presentation, that, that science that you should have to the lay public? I'm not sure I understand your question. So, so in organizing the presentation, what should they um, be thinking? You mean in terms of behind, like behind the organization, or no? Um, the attitude. Oh, the attitude yeah, that scientists should models. have. Okay, when they're presenting to yeah, the public. When you prepare mm -hmm. That's a really good question too. I think uh, I think you need to think very carefully about you know what takeaways you really want them to have. What is the most important point of your research that you want to share, and how can you share that in a way that they will understand it. And I think, again, practice comes, you know, practice is a really powerful thing there where once you come up with that, what is this main idea that I really want them to take away, you're going to want to test that with some other non-scientists to say, do you understand this? Is this engaging for you? So I think, I mean, what I think about is like, what is, the, what is kind of the one takeaway that I want them to have or what, you know, 
what, what are my main points in my presentation? So that's kind of the mindset that I would advise that, that you have as a scientist too, and, ha and how can I make sure that they understand that? You're welcome. Yes? Uh, often for giving presentations, I think one of the major questions which I have faced the person is, um, how much of background information should I, uh, should I give? Definitely it depends upon uh, whom you're addressing, mm -hmm. whom you're presenting in front of. But, um, even then, I, I believe it's a difficult question to answer. Um, because I, I think this history is really, really important, that you need to know what you're dealing with first before you're talking about something. Mm -hmm. But then, um, could you just uh, tell me as an experience that yes. you have so many presentations, how much background information should you be willing to give to your audience? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, too. I think, you know, again, I kind of come back to the time allotment that you have. You know, so, so for this presentation, I don't know if you noticed, but I kind of wrapped it in a story about my career experience. Because as I was building it, that's what I sort of found, like, oh, a lot of my thoughts kind of progress along with my career. But I wanted to make sure that I had the important takeaways in there that I really needed to make sure that you left the presentation with. And then I almost backed into, OK, this is how much time I have to tell my own story. And then, you know, OK, what level of detail do I want to go to within this hour? You know, how, how much detail can I really go into in an hour? Well, it's not even an hour. You know, I talked for probably 30 minutes by the time I add in all those clips and everything. So I often will go back to the time frame, and then I'll, I'll also think about my audience. So there's another version of this where I, you know, well, we have several versions of it, but where I go into a lot more emphasis on the research that's behind all these findings. But I, you know, I, I didn't, I thought you guys would rather just sort of know, like, this is what you do. You know, <laughs> these are the takeaways that you can, that you can take. And so I just mentioned, you know, because, and there is research behind it. So if you're interested, you can look up more. So I, I kind of start with the time frame. There are several ways to do it, but I think the time frame and the audience are the two things that you want to focus on. You're welcome. Do we have time for one more? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. I think developing your own style is really important. But I think you also need to keep in mind the audience that you're presenting to. Um, so, and, and that's, you know, in terms of age, in terms of culture, in terms of what type of presentation it is. So I think you definitely want to develop your own style. I heard somebody once describe it as you want to be the best version of yourself up here, you know. So, so you want to be, um, you know, if you're, if you're somebody who sort of likes to hide behind the podium back here, you might need to fight that a little bit, right, to get out here and connect with your audience. But you still want to develop your own style, keeping in mind, you know, the, the, the occasion. Okay? So I will be around all week, so I'm happy to, to talk to anybody one-on-one -on -one or answer more questions. But thank you so much. This was such a pleasure.